I, I don't know that I'd ever remember, normally speaking, when I'm ministering on Sunday mornings and Sunday nights, usually there, there's kind of two different things. And usually the Sunday morning kind of has a certain series that I'm teaching and preaching, and then Sunday evenings is usually a little bit different. Uh, I've been ministering out of different scriptures on Sunday morning and Sunday night, but the thing has been the same. And a while back, the Lord just really impressed upon me to begin to teach upon prayer and to minister on prayer. And uh, I, I've been doing that for a little while, and just there's been several different things even along the way that the Lord has spoken to me through uh, the gifts of the Spirit and to teach prayer, to teach prayer, to teach prayer, to equip in prayer. And so it's, it's been a... And it, uh, uh, a nice journey for me also as I went back to many scriptures on prayer, kind of dug into them freshly and looked at them freshly and, and quickening my prayer life and causing me to re-examine my prayer life and to how to press in a little more, step up a little more, whatever phrases we would like to use. Uh, I share with it, you know, there's tremendous promises in God's word about prayer. And it almost just goes beyond our imagination the things that God promises to us as a result of our prayer life. And but sometimes it's a process. And sometimes there's a lot of things that happens in the process of praying that prayer and before we see the manifestation of it. And sometimes there's periods of time in between when we pray and when we see the answer. And a lot of times people wonder, why is that, God? Why is it that I pray this? And, and maybe this is your perfect will, but yet... It seems like there's a period of time and there's a process and, and there's a season before I see that prayer answered. And, and sometimes, I'm going to share some scriptures tonight, sometimes there's things that God is doing in our hearts. Sometimes there's things that God is doing in our life as we go through those seasons of prayer, those times of prayer. So what I really want to do tonight is I want to talk to you a little bit about that. And when we get into the meat of what I want to teach tonight, you're going to see that it's dealing primarily with that season of prayer and what may be taking place on the inside of us, on the inside of our hearts during that time and during that season. Um, John chapter 14 is where I've been at on Sunday nights, and we began at verse 12. Uh, very, very, I say unto you, verse 12, I'll go ahead and read that again. He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do because I go unto my Father. Verse 13, And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now there's one little phrase that I want to talk about tonight. Whatsoever you shall ask. Whatsoever you shall ask. So obviously it's talking about asking, isn't it? It's about talking about coming to God and asking. Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. So I want to examine a little bit tonight the whatsoever I shall ask. And talk about asking and what that may involve and why sometimes you say, Pastor, if it's that easy, why isn't everybody seeing answers to their prayers? If it's that simple, we just ask, why is it everybody seeing answers to their prayers? Why is it I prayed prayers that didn't get answered? You might be asking those questions, and, and I'm not going to give you the answer to all of that tonight, but I'm going to direct you in a direction that will show you why sometimes there's a little bit involved here and what might be taking place. Whatsoever you shall ask. Now, oddly enough, that word ask in and of itself tells us a whole bunch. That word ask there, if you look into the Greek, is a word that is very significant if you dig into it a little bit. It means ask, to call for, to crave, and desire, and require. So whatsoever you shall crave in my name, that will I do. Whatsoever you shall desire in my name, that will I do. Whatsoever you shall require in my name, that will I do. But there's something very significant about this word ask. This word ask in the Greek is talking about somebody who is, so to speak, in a lesser place of status, coming to ask of somebody who is of greater status. So obviously if I'm coming to God and I'm asking, then obviously I'm the lesser asking the greater. But I'm the one who is dependent asking the one who I'm dependent upon. And 
The same way that that word is used in other places in there, it's talking about maybe a son coming to a father as a head of the household and asking something of him. It's also used in, in an instance where somebody, a subject, would go to a king and ask of him. And you might say, what is the significance of that? There's a couple of really interesting points about that. First of all, it shows us that we come to prayer in a position of dependence upon him. We come to prayer in a position of, of submission unto Him. We come to prayer in a position of, so to speak, surrender unto Him. A lesser going to the one who is greater, whom they are dependent upon. So we're talking about asking as a, an act of dependence. I don't know about you guys. Have you ever been where you really needed to ask somebody something you didn't want to ask them? That happens, doesn't it? Like, you know what? I, I know I need to ask this person that, and I know I'm kind of dependent upon them in this situation, but I don't really want to do this. It's talking about asking for someone who's greater. And maybe sometimes in, in our own walk, we get to that place and we think, you know what? I know who God is, and, and I know that God's a prayer answering God, but I really don't want to go ask this of Him. Maybe I'll just handle it myself. Maybe I'll just do it my own way. Maybe I don't want to go to him as a step of dependence and ask God for something that seems so small. You see, it's interesting too to know that that word ask. What's fascinating about that word ask, Jesus never uses that word of himself. That word is only used of you and I Asking of God. When Jesus is talking about asking of the Father, he's never using that Greek word. You think, what's the significance about that? That says something about Jesus, doesn't it? He's God's equal. He's the Father's equal. That's right there in and of itself. The mere usage of that word is revealing to us the divinity of Christ. Jesus is God. So when he goes to the Father God, he's not asking as a lesser to a greater. He's asking as an equal. You see, sometimes the, the most simple truths of the Bible just get past us like that. You know, that's one of the most basic truths of Christianity. Jesus is God. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Amen? Amen. Say the preacher's sermon to me the other night over the phone. You go down to verse 14 and it, it tells you who the Word is. The only begotten of the Son. You look into Revelation chapter 19 and, and when Jesus is getting ready on his horse and getting ready for the second coming and it fires, the eyes are like fire and the sword's coming out of his mouth and King of Kings and Lord of Lords written on his thighs. It says, and his name is the Word of God. Hallelujah. So we know who he is. We know who the Word is. We understand that he's God, don't we? The Bible says that even Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. So just in that simple word, there's a lot of revelation for us. A lot of understanding. Go to 1 John chapter 5. Write this down, Sailor Island. This be in your sermon. This is, the, this is the conclusion of your sermon. Have you preached it yet? Yeah. You already preached it? I'm behind scale here. Did it work? Yeah. Right, here's your second one. First John chapter 5, verse 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word. Who's the Word? Jesus, right? And the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Right there is the Trinity. There's three in heaven. There's, there's three in heaven that bear record. The Father... God, the Word, Jesus is God, Holy Ghost, He's God, and these three are one. So we see just in that simple uses of the Word, we see the fine details of the Word of God. That we, we can see the understanding of who Jesus is by the simple usage of a word asked. You know, I always tell people, Jesus is revealed in every word of the Bible. Amen. And right there in that word asked, we see a revelation of who Jesus Christ is. The mere fact that that's a word that is used for you and I, but it's not used of Jesus, says he's distinctly different than you and I are. He's God. You see, a lot of people don't like that simple idea. See, why would anybody not like the divinity of Christ? Why would anybody not like the idea that Jesus is God? Because that places an authority in our life. Because if he's God and he is, then there's an authority to his word that's above everything else. It's above my thinking. It's above 
my emotions. It's above my reasoning. It's above my understanding. It's above what's politically correct. It's above what society says is right or society says is wrong. If he's God and he's Lord of Lords and King of Kings, then the word he speaks has an authority like nothing else does. And a lot of people don't want that. They want to do what they think. They want to do what they feel. They want to feel, do what modern society says is right. What the political situation that says is right. But you see, you can't accept Christ as God and not bow your knee to it. You can't accept Christ as God and not submit yourself to his words. People say, well, I believe in Jesus. I say, why don't you believe what he says then? You can't separate the two. If you believe who he is, you've got to believe what he says. Amen? Amen. Okay, just make sure we're here. That's just a little side of that. <laughs> Go to James chapter 4. We're just looking at asking tonight. So we understand that when we ask, we're, that word there is talking about somebody coming, a lesser coming to a greater. And the mere word itself implies dependence and prayer life. And probably one of the greatest enemies in, in, in prayer is, is, is pride us thinking we can do it ourselves. I can pull this off. I can handle this. I, I don't need to commit this to the Lord in prayer. I don't need to pray about this. And sometimes when people pray about the small things, people act like they're goofy. But in, in Philippians chapter 4 that we've been saying, is talking about what? Pray in all things. Pray about everything. So why sometimes might I be praying then, Pastor, and not seeing the results? James chapter 4, verse 3. I mean, nothing, it starts right off with that. You ask and receive not. That was the question, wasn't it? Why do I pray and sometimes not receive? Because you ask to miss that you may consume it upon your lust. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss. I want to stop for a moment and just consider that word amiss. And what it means to ask amiss. This, I think, is a, a verse that, that quite often is, it is greatly misunderstood. For a lot of years, <coughs> excuse me, I heard that verse taught as if you ask amiss meant you were praying outside of God's will. And that's really, I mean, yeah, that's true, but that's not a good application of that verse. That implies a lot more. In other words, there is a thing. If you ask a miss, that meant you prayed for, for something to happen, and, and then what you were praying to happen really wasn't God's will. You know, you just missed God's will. You just missed the target. You just missed the spot. And if you would have adjusted that and been in line and prayed in God's will, it would have happened. Well, yeah, we've got to pray in God's will. But that's not really an accurate application of that verse. And if we stop for a moment and examine it a little bit, we'll see that it's completely different. Because what it's talking about is we ask of this because of the motivation of our heart. You see, it's a lot easier to say, well, I just miss God's will, I'll try it again. Than it is to really examine our heart in our prayer life. And say, hey, is my heart wrong? Is my motivation wrong? Am I praying for this result out of a heart that's not right? You see, because if we examine the context, it really seems to be that that's what I was talking about. Because the definition of that is whatever is evil in character, base, destructive, or injurious. Whatever is morally or ethically Wrong qualities, emotions, passions, and deeds. If we ask out of a heart that's wrong, we're asking a mess. <laughs> so that process that I'm talking about where we come to God and maybe we lay something before Him in prayer, and maybe there's that season or that time that we're, before we see the manifestation of that, maybe in that season and that time is the time that we need to adjust our hearts and deal with our hearts. Shout it too much right now. 
You see, there's a lot of things and possibilities in the Word of God of things that hinder our prayer life. You know, one of the things that Jesus connects to, 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 to prayer problems quite often is unforgiveness. I mean, that's a big one. You know, Jesus taught the parable, and you've heard me teach about that before, where the person came to the debtor and was begging for mercy, and, you know, have mercy on me, and, and, and so on and so forth, and, and that debtor forgave that debt and didn't, didn't uh, uh, <coughs> demand that they pay it. And then that debtor immediately went out and went out, and as they go out, somebody else runs up to them and says, hey, will you forgive my debt? And the one who had just been forgiven of the debt would not give, would forgive that debt. Now, I don't know about you guys, but that's pretty plainly bogus, isn't it? And that, that's a parable I share with you guys many times that the Lord used powerfully in my life. Because when I first got saved at, at 25 years old, there were some people in my life that I had a very hard, bitter heart toward. And people who had, were doing the same stuff that I had been doing that I asked God to forgive me of. So here I go, God, God, forgive me of this mess. I get up and still have a hard heart toward those doing the same thing. And that's exactly what that prayer was talking about. And beloved, Mark chapter 11 very plainly connects with us that, that, that our prayer life will be hindered if we have unforgiveness in our heart. Asking of this, one of the areas we need to ask is unforgiveness in our heart. So maybe you say, well, I'm praying about this and, and I'm looking to see an answer to this and, and I'm looking to see manifestation with this and God's saying, you know what, let's talk about your heart for a minute. You're asking of this. You're asking of something in your heart that shouldn't be there. And maybe we need to first deal with this. And then we'll get into the prayer stuff. The Bible talks about a lot of things. You know, one of the scriptures that has really hit me with this. Because one of the things like I've shared is, as I've been going through this time of, of teaching and, and sharing about prayer and, and ministering about it and, and going into a season for myself, is really, God, I want you to examine my prayer life. I want you, God, to show me where I'm coming up short in my prayer life. I want you, God, to get my prayer life in line with where you want it to be. And there was one scripture that I just read the last couple of days, and, and I thought, Lord... I guess I've never really looked at that in the context of prayer. But the Lord has greatly searched my heart with it. Go to Matthew chapter 24 for this point. Matthew chapter 24. Hallelujah. And this is the scripture the Lord has used in my heart. like an odd application. But I think you'll understand it when I get to it. Matthew 24, verse 20, 48, excuse me, 48. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. And he shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of. And you think, what in the world do you see in that verse that has anything to do with prayer, Pastor? And I just, the Lord just kept quickening that to my heart. And just quickening it to me. And the Lord, I don't understand what you're talking about there. You see, it's talking about somebody who was careless about their life because they were thinking that Christ wasn't coming when he said he was. In other words, they were living their life in a way that was not in anticipation of the rapture of the church. And because they were not living their life in anticipation of the rapture of the church, their life was very careless. And I, Lord, I understand that. I, I, I preached that. I, I've taught that. A multitude of times, Lord, I understand that passage of scriptures. But what does that have to do with my prayer life? Well, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. You know, we, I, I've done this teaching before and, 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 and 
preaching before, and, and years ago when I would do a lot of evangelism, I taught a lot on the rapture, and one of the things I would go into churches and teach about was I don't believe Christians are really ready for the rapture. They're not really living like they're expecting it. Not that they're not ready, not that they're going to go into the rapture, but they're not expecting it. Because the Bible says that if we are expecting the rapture, we purify ourselves. And I see a lot of Christians living pretty careless lives, not purifying themselves and getting ready for that moment to meet Jesus. So if you apply that same line of thought to our prayer life, let me ask you this. Are, is your prayer life the prayer life of somebody who is expecting the rapture to happen at any time? I mean, think about it. If somehow or another you knew that, that a week from now that Jesus was going to rapture the church, would your prayer life change between now and then? Are you praying with a heart and, and a sense of urgency that, Lord, if there's something in my heart that hinders my prayers from being answered, Lord, show that to me, reveal that to me, because I need to deal with that, because time is running short, and I'm praying for the souls of men and women. I'm praying for the souls of my family. I've got To look at some of the scriptures here. And just stop for a moment and consider what we're talking about here. And consider the context. James chapter 4. I'm sorry, I said two didn't. I'm getting heavy myself. I'm sorry. James chapter 4, verse 3. You ask and may see not because you ask amiss. And we're looking at asking amiss. That you may consume it upon your lust. But notice the context. And as I always teach you when we're learning to study the Bible, always look at it in the context. From whence comes wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, not even unto your lust that war in your members. Verse 2. You lust and have not. That's an issue of the heart. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight war, yet you have not because you ask not. In other words, it's all dealing with the lust, the consuming upon your lust in verse 3. It's all dealing with something inside of us. 
It's all dealing with something that living within us. You know, there's an example. And uh, I used to read it years ago, and I, I just, there was one of the scriptures that I just, I thought, Lord, I know it's true, but it just, it just didn't really, I didn't quite grasp it. When the Israelites were being delivered out of Egypt, I mean, they're just overwhelmed with lust, wanting to go back to Egypt. And I used to like, why would anybody want to go back to bondage? But after years of watching people, I see a lot of people who want to go back to their bondage. A lot of people <laughs> want to go drugs and want to go back to the bondage. Get driven from alcohol, want to go back to the bondage. Get delivered from gambling, want to go back to the bondage. But they began to lust after, you know, oh God, I, I remember the melons and I remember the bread and I remember all the good food back in Egypt. They were wanting to go back to the bondage because of their lust for food. And I used to read that, and Lord, I, I just don't, how could that be? But beloved, I understand quite well now. There's all kinds of people who are killing themselves in America because of the way they eat. Who can't get control of themselves because of lust for food. They, it's, it's, not, it's not hard to believe, is it? People do it all the time. They get, something, they, they, they get some kind of bondage in their life, whether it be the food or, or drugs or alcohol or some kind of lust of the flesh. And it's in their heart and they just can't seem to shake it. They keep going back to it and back to it and back to it. And that's what it's talking about. Stuff that's inside of us that's affecting our prayer life and hindering Psalm 78. You see, beloved, the question here is not so much what we're asking for, but why we're asking for it. I, I remember years ago here reading the account, and I, I was talking this morning a little bit about Charles Finney. He was an evangelist. And many people consider him one of the most powerful evangelists in the history of church history. And uh, I remember him telling the county was ministering on writing in his writings about prayer. And, and kind of along this line, he used the illustration of a of a lady who came up to him at one of his revival meetings and, and says, and was crying, said, Oh, will you pray for my husband? He's making my life so miserable. Will you please pray for him to be saved? And he said, Absolutely not. Because that prayer will never be answered. He says, what do you mean? You want my phone answer my prayer for my husband to be saved? Not with that motivation, because the only reason you want to be saved is so your life will be better. I mean, it sounds good. But the motivation wasn't concerned for his salvation. The motivation was he'd be easier to live with when he got saved. He was asking this. Just to make her life easier. Y'all can have kind of fun. Well, that was those prayers, I guess. <laughs> I've been praying for that neighbor so they put me in so loud. Lord, save that neighbor. They're keeping me awake at night. <laughs> Psalm 78. Verse 18. And this is talking about them when they were lusting for that food. <clears throat> and they tempted God in their hearts by asking me for their lust. You say, what in the world doesn't the Bible tell us to give us the day our daily bread? Is there something wrong with asking God for food? Absolutely not. Is there something wrong with asking God for your provision? Absolutely not. The problem was the motivation in their heart. They weren't wanting provision. They were wanting something that they were and grabbed a hold of them and seized their heart. Rather than saying, God set me free from this mess. They were saying, God, feed this mess. See the difference? They were asking a mess. Say, what do we do, Pastor? How do we keep in our hearts and our lives from asking a mess? How, 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 how do you do that? How do, I, how do I, Pastor, keep from praying selfish prayers? Two things. 
things we've got to understand here. First of all, we've got to understand in that season, in that time in our prayer life, that quite often maybe God is working things out on the inside of our hearts and preparing us for the breakthrough or the answer to come forth. First of all, we have to understand that and then say, okay, Lord, let me get with you. Let me talk with you, Lord. And let's talk about my heart. Let's talk about what you need to do in me, Lord. Let's talk about what you need to change in me, Lord, so that answer will be manifest. And then we got to understand how God changes us and how God does things in our life. You see, again, you gotta, it's not, well, I'm going to try harder to do better, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. We have to look to Christ and Him crucified. We have to look to Jesus Christ to not just change, to change our circumstances and change the situation, and but to change our hearts. And we have to realize in the heat of that battle, in the heat of that moment, we have to look to Christ and say, Lord, you deal with my heart. You change my heart. You change the inside of me that needs to be changed. Just like the, the brazen serpent in the Old Testament when they got bit by the serpents and they were dying and, and Moses cried out to God and God told him, says, hey, put a serpent on a, on a pole and hold it up and, and, and everybody who looks at that is going to be healed. But we're in that situation and Lord, I don't know what's happening here. I know I'm in this battle. I'm not seeing the victory come forth. Is there something in my heart that needs to be changed? We need to lift up our eyes to Jesus Christ and His words and put our faith in Him and trust in His spirit change in the inside of us and change our heart and make us ready for that prayer to come forth. Yes. I said, my teeth, my prayer is not now I lay me down to sleep, right, Lord, my soul again. <laughs> you see, beloved, if we really we, we preach and we talk and oh, we're in the last days, Jesus can consume, why be living like it then? Seriously. Why are we praying like that? Why is our life consecrated like that? Hallelujah. You see, beloved, it's very simple. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 17. Here's what we look to Christ to do in our life. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Hallelujah. Am I still on the Holy Spirit's working? Like the silence in the room. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. It's talking about love. Doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own. It's not easily provoked. And think of knowing. Love doesn't seek its own. Love doesn't think evil. So if love is the motivation of our prayer life, then we're not going to be asking to hit upon our own lust, are we? And not that there's anything with asking wrong with asking for yourself, not that there's anything asking for the blessings of God fully to be on your life. You're told to do that. You're told in the scriptures here that whatever we ask in his name, he will do. We're encouraged to ask for big things. We're encouraged to ask for mighty things. But we have to be careful what our motivation is. We have to be sure that that motivation is love. First Corinthians chapter 13, let me read that again. Doth not be held, behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. Think it, no evil. So what I'm trying to tell you here is that the first thing we've got to do in our prayer life is probably our own heart on the altar. To say, Lord, examine my heart. Search my heart out, Lord. And we've got to look to Christ and Him crucified. And look for Him to do a work on the inside of us that produces love so that our prayer life is motivated by love. 
See, Romans chapter 5 says the love of God is shed abroad in our heart. Galatians 5.22 tells us the fruit of the Spirit is love. So if I'm looking to Him, and I'm asking Him to do that work, and I'm asking Him to fill me with His Spirit, Him to fill me with His love, and allowing that love to be the motivation of my prayer life, then I'm not going to ask Him this. But I wonder, <clears throat> do we really go to God and put our heart on the altar? Say, God, you search out my prayer life. You examine my prayer life. Not just how much time I spend in prayer. But what's my motivation? Why am I praying this? Am I asking of this, Lord? You see, there's a lot of refining that will take place in the prayer closet. There's a lot of work that will take place in our heart. And I believe with all of my heart that I know myself personally some of the greatest seasons of growth I've ever went through have come in those times in the prayer closet when it was most intense. When I was seeking out God and searching out God and saying, God, I, I need you to move in this situation, God. Examine my heart, examine my life. If there's anything, God, that enters this prayer, please show it to me. It's been some of the greatest times of growth that I personally went through. And I think maybe we shy away from that too much. And we pull back too easy. And we're too content to just say some little prayer, and you know, I lay me down and say, wait, what my soul gave me. And rather than to be that person who will enter into the prayer closet and say, Lord, here I am. Use me. Whatever needs to be done, we find out of it. Just like Isaiah chapter 6 when he saw the Lord. He said, whoa, I'm a man, I'm done. And angelic beings came down with the coal, touched upon his lips, and purified the prophet of God, and set him forth. We may need to be in the prayer closet and maybe say, whoa, that Change my heart, oh Lord. Change my heart. You see, what I'm sharing with you, this simple little teaching on prayer tonight, is so very important. Because we got to realize that what I've been sharing with some of the mornings is the importance of our prayer life. And how much impact we have with our prayer life. But we must be willing vessels. And I think we need to realize the season and the time and the hour we're in. It's one thing to say, oh, Lord, Jesus is coming back. These are urgent times. There's another thing to be the person of prayer in urgent times. And that's the call. Was there ever a time you can say, well, these are perilous times. They are perilous times, aren't they? And we need to be the most consecrated Christians of any time. Amen? We need to be the most consecrated prayer workers of any time. And we need to be willing to go into the prayer closet and put our hearts on the altar and allow this process to take place. Amen? Amen. 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 Amen.